Today on Rambling About Cars, are sedans and hatchbacks really dead? We don't think so. And we've got some pretty compelling evidence to bring our case to Ford and GM because you know what? We want our sedans. We want our hatchbacks. We know you feel the same out there. So ladies and gentlemen, sedan savants, <laughs> hell yeah, crazy. it's podcast time. I'm Christopher Smith. Across the way is Chris Bruce. Bruce, I, I feel this is going to be a little loosey-goosey today. This is going to be a loosey-goosey one. We don't have a guest this week, um, so it's just going to be you and I, and it's going to be very much rambling about cars. We have a lot of ra- <laughs> uh, we have a lot to ramble about. Yes, we do. Um, so yeah, so let's get started. Um, all, all relatively sedan and hatchback related because yeah, like small, basically small er cars, you know, midsize and below. So it, it, that's kind of what we're looking at. It, I don't know. I could go for another Crown Vic. That's big. Yeah. I but see, I told you Lucy Goosey. Yeah. I <laughs> I didn't prepare anything for that. So if you want to talk Crown Vic, that's on you. Oh, I'm uh, totally not prepared. We're just gonna ramble this one, man. Okie doke, man. Um, R- so, ramble us forward. Yeah. So kind of what got us on this this week is that um so as we are talking right now, it hasn't yet debuted, but by the time the show ends, it will have debuted, is the 2022 Honda Civic. Um, so we're getting a new generation of the Civic. It'll be its 11th generation. It's, you know, been around first gen, what, 78, I think, late seventies, right? Mid, mid seventies, mid seventies, late seventies, mid seventies, late seventies, something like that. Yeah. Somewhere Um, around there. It, it, you know, it's a venerable vehicle. So here we're looking at the outside of it, which we've kind of seen before, but this is a different angle than that original press photo they put out. I'm still not necessarily in love with it. Um, I think it's kind of, I think it's too conservative in my opinion. Um, Mm -hmm. But you and Kyle last week, we were looking at it and you guys both disagree with me. So, you know, everything's in the eye of the beholder. Well, Kyle made, Kyle made a good point that it's a Honda Civic. It it doesn't have to really be wild. It, It just has to be stalwart and friendly and good on gas and reliable. Right. Sure, but I still think you can have some interesting design in there. Mm-hmm. But what I do think is good is this image that we're looking up now, folks, is the interior. And we and haven't Han- seen this before. We had not to, to previously, we had not seen right. this, no. And what's really cool here is that Honda put in this really interesting mesh like cover across the dashboard that incorporates the air vents into it. So it basically hides the air vents behind this mesh cover. Um, our coworker, Brett, he said it looks like almost very like forties, early fifties. And I can kind of see where he's coming yeah. from. It's almost an art deco thing a little bit. It really is. I mean, that's my initial Im- impression. Exactly. Is that it has a very, very kind of, I don't know about 40 so much, but definitely kind of like a, a, a 50s luxury vibe to it. it. It's just it's clever, especially in you know this class of car. This is, you know, a fact that Honda put out when they put this car out is that the Civic is the best selling vehicle amongst first time car buyers, millennials and Gen Z. And um, let me pull up the number here. I believe in the last five years they have sold 1.7 million of them and so that you know to that demographic it's a huge vehicle so you know if you're a youngish person this is still a lot of style and a really kind of cool package Um, yeah and and folks remember those numbers later on 1.5 million 1.7 million oh, in sorry, 5 one, years one, one okay 1. 1.7 a little bit little bit dyslexic there 1.7 <laughs> in 5 years um is that that's for sedan and hatchback i'm assuming i think on. that's just every all yeah. of them but yeah it's uh, it's a it's, super impressive figure yeah no it's very impressive and the other thing you get so we unfortunately honda only released images of the touring model which is the top trim so on the lower trims all the lower trims you still get a digital gauge cluster um honda's press release was kind of weirdly vague about that it says on the left hand side you get a seven inch digital gauge cluster that shows the speedometer and the tachometer and on the right hand side you get an analog speedometer so I don't, I, I got to be totally honest here. I haven't seen images of the other trims. I don't understand why you need two speedometers next to each other, but I guess it is what it is. 
Um, right. But still, you're getting a digital gauge cluster in this class of vehicle a, a, as a standard feature. And that that's that's a cool thing. And then on the Touring, you get a 10.2 inch entirely digital gauge cluster. Um, so you don't there's none of that analog stuff. Um, and yeah, no, I, I think I mean, I think it's I think it looks great outside. Um, I don't think it's going to rock the, the, the world with its, with its exterior styling. I, don't I think, think it, so. I, I think the, I think the interior is nice, but I don't think it has to rock the world with its exterior styling. I like the fact that it it's pulling from the Accord. I think it's it pulling is. a lot of design cues from the Accord. It very much um, is. I think I, I like it better than the current generation, which I think tries to be a little too shouty, even, even outside of, of the type R trim. It's, I think it's trying to, to speak a little too much stylistically. So, I mean, I think Honda is going to continue to sell a bazillion of these. And so I disagree. I don't think it looks as good as the previous generation, but I think it looks much better than the cor- current Corolla, both inside and out. Yeah, I, I would agree on that. Um, and, you know, it's also interesting you bring up the Corolla. Uh, what's another one of the best-selling cars still in, in the United States? Toyota yeah. Corolla. We'll we'll talk more about that in a bit. We're we're going on going along here on the Civic, and you know Honda kind of rolled this out a little strange. Yeah, they and, did. I and, don't and, necessarily know why. Well, I'm I'm going to take a moment here for a little little automaker diatribe. <laughs> um, but may, maybe a little inside baseball. Once upon a time, an automaker would have a new vehicle. They would debut the vehicle. Usually, a few months or so before you could buy it in the dealers and that was it when they debuted the vehicle they would provide photos they would have an an announcement uh, detailing the vehicle inside and out and it seems like more and more automakers are dividing that process they're splitting it up because we actually saw the 2022 honda civic exterior debut a week ago yeah, quite. Yeah, well, I thought it was even longer than that. Yeah, yeah you're. It oh, might oh wait, been I, I, I think there was a debut maybe for China. There was, yes. Okay, that's that's what you're it correct. was. There was a, a, a debut for China, which it's almost the same car. The the one it's we're getting in the US is different. different. I'm gonna, I'll pull right. up an image now for our YouTube listeners. Or, right. Sorry, yeah, our YouTube listeners. Um, but. So yeah, so yeah, I mean it's it they they had their China debut for the exterior and then they de- they debuted the exterior and then they debuted the entire car but as you just said and and Bruce you wrote up the debut article they didn't really have full information available even right now. No, there's still some things we don't exactly know. Well, it's not necessarily that. It's also that we didn't get good um they didn't show all the trims is kind of the issue. Right. Uh, and, and and automakers, why are you doing this? If you have a new product, let's let's see the product. Let's see it inside. Let's see it outside. I know the concept here is we want to stretch out the excitement. We want to we want to make it run longer. Did did I talk about this last week? Because I'm getting some deja vu here. If I didn't talk about it last week on the podcast, it was either last been, week or two weeks ago. I, I've certainly been bitching about it for months now because it's not just Honda that we've seen this um, come from. We've seen it from several automakers. So, oh yeah. No note, note from us. Hey, if you got a product, just get it out there. You know. Here, vamp for me for just a second. I'm gonna go shut my dog up so he doesn't bother our podcast he's, anymore. Even, so just, even even your dog is like automakers. He's not, yeah, he's I've, he I've, wants I've more had enough. Info. So give me just I've had enough. literally like five seconds and just we're, just just talk civic. We're all rambling about cars here today. Smith, Bruce, Bruce's dog. Bruce's dog is amazing. He has some of the most incredible opinions on vehicles. And you know, when it comes to the civic, I've actually, you know, Bruce was saying that. Um, it's, it's one of the best-selling cars for younger people. I don't fall into the younger demographic, but I have been kicking around the idea of a new car to replace my Mazda six for, oh, about the past year and a half. I know that doesn't necessarily make me a serious buyer, but it's still, uh, it's still something on my radar Mm -hmm. and I've almost pulled the trigger on a Honda civic several times. So it's not just younger buyers that are looking at these vehicles. I was I was impressed when I drove the current Civic. Um, I, you know, not not too keen on the transmission, but I mean, it's it's not a bad transmission. 
Um, it was just a, a good vehicle all around, I thought, and I really like having the hatchback. Um, and yeah, so I don't see any reason why Honda won't continue to sell a bazillion of these. And I think that might be a good time to take us into the meat of this podcast. What do you say, Bruce? I think that's fair. I just real quick, I just want to hit the tech specs on the Civic just before we move on. Mm -hmm. Um, So the two liter naturally aspirated four cylinder, it carries over, still makes 158 horsepower and 138 pound feet of torque. And the only gearbox available for that is a CVT. The EX and Touring trims, they get, uh, they still use the 1.5 liter turbocharged four cylinder, but power is up. Uh, 180 horsepower, 177 pound feet. That's up six horsepower and 15 pound feet from the current generation. So not insignificant. It's only available with a CVT, but uh, fuel economy more or less is up across the board. Um, It doesn't lose any fuel economy, but the EX, the only changes in the city, the LX, which is the base model, you're up one MPG in the city, two highway and two combined. So it's negligible, but for a vehicle that's also a touch bigger, I believe, what is it, one point? So uh, wheelbase is up 1.4 inches, overall length Mm -hmm. is up 1.3 inches. So a slightly bigger vehicle, but slightly better fuel economy. You can't really, can't be too upset with that. No, and uh, and, I mean, like I said, I've driven the current Civic. 180 horsepower doesn't sound like much, but I mean, I was thoroughly impressed for what that vehicle is. Um, I mean, I hesitate to call it entry level because it was comfortable. I thought it was zippy enough to to be satisfying in the hatchback form. It still had a lot of practicality. So, yeah, I don't see any reason why. I mean, I don't see anything in this new vehicle that would, for some reason, kill its sales among oh God, no. uh, among buyers. Better interior styling is a you know a kind of a punt maybe it, you like it better maybe you don't but interior is better better fuel economy if you get the turbo more power if not mm-hmm. at least the power is the same it's i think it's still going to be a success it's the civic after all this is its 11th generation this is a vehicle that is has established itself um oh i was going to ask you real quick have you owned or driven a civic in the past any civic what? Well, I mean, I've, I've driven the current generation Civic. I've never owned one. I've, oh, of 34 cars I've owned in the last, oh gosh, 15, 20 some odd years, I've danced around a Honda. I almost bought a, uh, uh, what was it, like an 87 or 88 Prelude. Um, and, and I've danced around Civics, but I've never pulled the trigger on one. And I think it's time. I mean, I think I'm overdue. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I've driven one Civic. It was what the the hatchback SI, which I think was what an 02, 03 um, when they were doing that. And it had kind of the nifty shifter that kind of comes out in an L shape. And you go, I test drove one of those when I was looking at my mini um, and my buddy in high school, he had either an 84 or an 86 Civic that had been like passed down through the family. Like it was his dad's car. And then it was the car his sister learned to drive on. And then it was the car that he got. And he literally, the family did not care about this car. We would go to the movies and just leave the keys in it. Like someone wants to take it. That's fine. Cause yeah. keep in mind, this is an 86 in 03, 04. And it had been driven that much there. There was, that car had given up all it's good. So <laughs> I take that back. A friend of mine in high school had an, like an old civic. Mm-hmm. Um, might've been late seventies or early eighties. Okay. Yeah. It was, it was gold. We called it the tater tot. <laughs> the thing, I mean, it, it's a civic. I hate to, I hate to just borrow all the cliches, but it was just like, where do you want to go? You won't necessarily get there fast, but you'll, you'll get, get there. there. There's, there's really, a, I remember one time, cause it was a manual. Um, mm-hmm. He was, he was having trouble changing gears. We got up underneath and looked and there was just a big rock that had gotten shoved up <laughs> into the linkage. It's, it's just like, here, give me a hammer. Bop. Okay, cool. It's fixed. Let's go. So, yeah. You know, I would, I would love to say that, uh, that Ford has the same legacy like that, but gosh, they don't have any more hatchbacks in the United States, do they? They... Well, so this is they something don't have we were going to discuss. Okay, let's 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 go ahead. Let's 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 hash this out. They don't have any traditional hatchbacks. They do not have any traditional ha- hatchbacks. The 
So something as we kind of prepared for this topic this week, which is about hatchbacks and small cars, I my research more or less focused on the hatchback aspects, mostly because that's kind of where my passion lies. So, uh, you know, I, I'll admit that. But the fact that a lot of the compact crossovers that are available today are what we call compact crossovers. If you looked at them 20 or 30 years ago, we would probably just call them hatchbacks. Um, the one that I looked at and I was like, oh, definitely, is the Hyundai Ionique 5. And uh, uh, for our, we're going to be looking at one here for our YouTube watchers. Um, and I understand that Hyundai kind of sells this as a crossover, but Smith, I want you to look at this car. T tell me what you think. Uh, yeah, that's, that looks like a hatchback. That looks like a five door. That looks like a five door hatch. And I mean, um, there is a little bit of ride height there. Th there's you can a little see bit of ride the wheel. Well, and the to top of the tire, like I, you can see where they're coming from, but that's just a hatchback and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just no. the fact that hatchbacks have kind of gotten the stigma on them of being boring or old fashioned or something like that. Whereas crossovers are the new hotness. And so things that might have one day in the back in the day might have been called one thing are now getting a different moniker, despite the fact that they're kind of the same thing. Well, I mean, for how long hatchback was associated with cheap. Yeah. Um, and and I mean, maybe we could we could point at the Honda Civic for that, because here's this little inexpensive car. that was a little hatchback at a time when vehicles in the United States were arguably as big as they've ever been in their lives. Mm hmm. And at least in this country, it, it kind of got a, a negative stigma. And that just burns me to no end because. Or I guess you should say a negative stigma again amongst some people, because a right. lot of people, you know, they love their they have loved their civics. It's just right. But then but then look what happened in recent years, like, say, with like with Audi, with their lift back. It's not a hatchback. It's a lift back. Sure. And and when the when the Panamera first came out. You know, something something similar with Porsche. It's like these are the vehicles. And, and of course, at that point, now they're touting. Look at all the capability you have with this lift back. It's like, yeah, we know <laughs> hatchbacks have been that way for freaking decades. That's why people tend to like them. But they got this negative stigma attached to them. Um, I mean, we're looking at another shot here of the Ionic 5 from the back. You know, earlier, Bruce, before we started, you said, you know, 20 years ago, this would just be called a hatchback. And you're absolutely right. That would be a, that would be a hatchback. Really, it doesn't even sit that high off the ground. It sits a little bit, I guess, a little bit higher than maybe a, a normal car would. But so, is, it, is it high enough to really make any difference? If I mean, you're not going to take that off road. No. And so as we're talking about this, I'm realizing I wrote about another perfect example of this today, and that is the forthcoming Volkswagen ID5. And so yes. the ID5 will be the it'll have a swoopier roof than the ID4, but otherwise the two vehicles will be the same. But Volkswagen sells both the ID4 and ID5, or at least positions them as crossovers. And again, Smith, you and I are looking at an image of this car. It, that's I, that that sets up it sets up a little bit higher than the Hyundai I think. Uh, okay, yeah. It, it sets much. up a little bit higher. No, not much. I mean, let's be honest. I don't think there is a crossover out there that really sits that much higher than just a stock sedan or a hatchback. Yes, there's going to be a little bit in there, but that seems to have become the defining point for a crossover, right? It's it's taller, it's rugged, and right. it's like is it? I, yeah. No, I mean a little bit extra height. Okay, so you're not going to worry about speed bumps or trying to get into your steep driveway quite as much. But you're not going to Moab. No. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to Moab with your crossover, especially with the street tires it comes on. Um I mean, you probably aren't even going to go down the two-track trail at your neighbor's ranch to go out to the watering hole. You're probably going to jump in the back of his pickup truck. Mm -hmm. I mean, Obviously, I mean, hey, it's 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 an image. I'm not anti crossover. No, no, um, no, no. Like I own one. Like it, no, it's just but, that it, it's the marketing more than it is the reality kind mm -hmm. of thing that you end up with these vehicles that are marketed as crossovers, where you're really stretching 
what a utility, you know, crossover is supposed to be crossover or what? Yeah. Crossover utility vehicle. Right. Like that. You're if, really if stretching you, that utility part. You know, if you, if you want to get like extremely technical and, and folks, I think I'm about to get extremely technical here. It, well, as technical as I can get, please. When you talk about definitions, and this is a subject that we've talked about before, you know, we vehicle have, yeah. definitions, um, a classic strict definition of an SUV is a body on frame vehicle. Yeah. Well, that's the, the way we try to use it when we're right. Right. Is that and, the, and, the, and then anything else that kind of goes in that direction is the crossover. That's a unibody based. So, I mean, technically speaking, how many vehicles would people consider an SUV that are really unibody based? I mean, if we're going to talk about something like, you know, like a Honda CRV, how many times do people refer to that as an SUV? Mm -hmm. You know, but technically you would call it a crossover. It's one of those areas where the definitions have become extraordinarily blurred, mm -hmm. where anything that sort of resembles something bigger and a little bit more rugged that might actually have more ground clearance that might actually have some off-road tires and some decent off-road capability. That's going to be considered an SUV as opposed to a crossover, which is going to be more car-like. And yeah, it's, it's another one of the areas where the definitions have become blurred. Right. Well, and have been blurred for a while. We've talked about yeah. this in our private chat at work that the Jeep Grand Cherokee is kind of the kind of the classic example of that. <laughs> oh, we all refer to of it as an SUV. It's, it's but, unibody. But it's been unibody for a while. Like yeah. it is a crossover, but no, for some, somehow it has been able to get over that hump of kind of the way we refer to these vehicles. It's, it's, it, the definition isn't always clear, even among people who are supposed to know about this industry. Yeah. Well, and uh, we had something similar when we were talking about the definition, the classic definition of a coupe right. and a sedan, because I mean, we have so many vehicles nowadays that are marketed as four door coupes. And it's like, well, you can't have, you can't have four doors with a coupe. A coupe is defined as a, as a two door, but I mean, there's also a strong argument that says, Coupe is also defined by its swooping roof line and not mm -hmm. necessarily related to doors. When you look at the, some of the classic definitions, they don't really talk about doors. They're talking more about the roof line and it being sort of a fastback shape. So, yeah, it's it's all a blurred mess, all a blurred mess. I think this is a good time to tell people to email us at podcast at motor one dot com to weigh in on your version of this blurred mess. Oh, totally. And, yeah, we love hearing from people. And maybe we should just wipe all the definitions clean and just call them cars and trucks for us, I, for us simpletons. Yep. No, I remember when I was first getting started, I had an editor. I was talking about, I think it was an, uh, it was either a Tahoe or an expedition. And in my copy, I called it a truck. And he's like, I get what you mean, but you can't call it that. You can't call it a truck. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but you know what? How many people, how many expedition owners out there right now have, have you know, gone out to get in their truck? Right. Let's, yeah. let's go take the, you know, hey. Yeah. It, we, we know we get the we get the point. The definitions, they blur. The one thing that isn't blurry is the fact that I can't go get a new Ford sedan or a new Ford hatchback. And no, I don't want an edge. I don't want an escape. You want an um, eco sport? I, I I certainly don't want an eco sport. <laughs> I mean, there's there's one area that you can say, okay, yes, a lot of these small subcompact crossovers are really just hatchbacks with a little more ground clearance, and I think that the body shape also has them a little bit taller. Um, yeah. One of the one of the things that I've always enjoyed about small hatchbacks is that they kind of feel like a go kart, even mm -hmm. the ones that aren't performance oriented. You feel a little bit like a go kart. Oh yeah, I'm. I haven't had that same sensation with a higher riding crossover. And I don't think you're going to because part of that comes from being close to the ground. Part right. of that comes from the the, the, the it's it's not, it's not so much the ground clearance. I think, but right. it's just the the center of gravity is generally. Yeah. I, I think the center of gravity kind of belies a little bit of of that ground clearance i think mm -hmm. the center of gravity ends up being much higher than you realize and yeah it, it just loses some of that that funness and that's why i argue that no there's still a place for small hatchbacks and sedans and i think ford and uh, and gm chevrolet in particular 
are just extraordinarily short-sighted on this. Oh, it's they are so they are so missing the boat here. Uh, for now, yeah. So this is kind of something we talked about in you know before we started recording. Is that your theory is that a lot of these companies are going to hurt inevitably when gas prices go up? Um, yes. You want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yes. Well, let me. I mean, let's start by saying, okay. Uh, I mean, we'll establish the facts. Um, a while ago, Ford said we're going to pull away from sedans and hatchbacks and we're yep. going to focus on our trucks and SUVs. Um, GM to their defense. I mean, they still have uh, sedans that they're supporting with Cadillac, but uh, you're not going to get anything from Buick. You're not going to get anything from Chevrolet. They still sell the Malibu. Um, the, 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 the Malibu is kind of on borrowed time. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, we have sedans and hatchbacks from other brands that are still doing quite well. And mm-hmm. the arguments for from these two automakers have been, well, the market just doesn't want sedans and hatchbacks anymore. And I mean, that is such a load of BS. That's that's just an excuse for them to not actually build decent sedans and hatchbacks. And And to make my case here, I went and pulled up all kinds of sales numbers. Um, The Ford Fusion in its last full year of production, which was 2018, 166,000 units sold. That's, I mean, when you look at 800,000 for an F-150 or for the F-Series in in total, I mean, that's that's a fairly small number, but it's still significant. It's still 166,000 sales that Ford is just saying, you know, we know what, we we don't need those. Um, Meanwhile... For a market that doesn't want hatchbacks or sedans, um, I'm going to reference 2019 numbers. I've got 2020 numbers that I'll also reference. But 2020 was obviously a sketch year because of COVID. But 2019, okay, the top 20, number 20 was the Nissan Sentra. And that's the old one before it got new one. Uh, yeah. it's, it's restyling that I think is actually a pretty sharp looking little car now. 20 at 184,000 sales. Um, the Altima was 18th. At 209,000, it would jump up to 11th, the Accord at 267,000 units. In the top 10 is the Toyota Corolla at 304,000 units. Number nine is the Civic at 325,000. Number eight is the Camry at 336,978 units. So, um, yeah, people still want to buy hatchbacks and sedans. And these numbers show that, you know, quality matters. Those are all names that have been established for quite a long time. And sorry, Ford, but when you have a fusion that you let wither on the vine for years, and then you say, well, the market's not asking for sedans. No, the market's not asking for your sedan because you've let it, you've just let it die a slow death. And you can say the same thing for the Taurus. Oh, the Taurus. I've had many Tauruses over the years. I always thought it was a good car, even when they were kind of, you know, jelly bean goofy there in the, in the mid and late nineties. But again, Ford updated the styling in 2010, but the platform was still the same Ford 500 underneath from 2005. They Which gave was it a Volvo a, platform originally, right? If, if, if I if I if I remember correctly, um, uh, I don't I don't know if they took it straight from Volvo or not. To be honest, okay, I know I, 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 know, I, I know I know I know there were some connections there. Yeah, um, but I mean there was the styling update for 2010. Um, and then there was another facelift, what, I think it was around 2014 or 2015. But, I mean, we're talking a minor facelift. The platform underneath never changed. Yeah, right. And you can't expect to to keep buyers interested when you have something stretching that long. And I know there are Dodge people out there that are saying, well, what about the Charger? Well, the Charger has endured, and, hey, it's cool that it has. But, you know, what's not on our sales list anywhere in the top 20 is a Dodge Charger. Nor is there a Chrysler 300, two vehicles that have both withered. I mean, it, hey, it's amazing they're still around. I think it's cool that they're still around. Chrysler um, 300 especially is amazing that it's still around. Yeah. And when you look at Altima, when you look at Accord, I mean, 2020, I, I don't like referencing these 2020 figures because 2020 was such an off year for everything in the U.S. Um, but technically speaking, the Toyota Camry was the sixth best-selling vehicle. So I will the, reference the 2020. Sixth, you know, 
Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I will reference 2020, though, because there is an announcement that Toyota put out in 2020. Mm -hmm. And granted, this does come from their marketing side. So, you know, there's going to be some spin to it. But I want to read this quote because I do think it's interesting. And this is from the company's marketing vice president, Cynthia Tenhouse. And she said, it's amazing how much of a demand there still is for sedans. We're expecting a 4 million unit market for sedans in 2020. We're happy to take as much of that market as we can. For us, that represents roughly 750,000 sales in the US. That's more than other o I'm sorry, that's more than other OEMs make altogether. And that's that's a fair point. There are companies that I I I would I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I am almost positive Jaguar Land Rover does not sell 750,000 vehicles <laughs> in total in the U.S. in 2020. Um, I, I, you know what? Talk just a second. I want to look it up because I'm curious. Okay. How Go many ahead. Oh, oh, oh I've, I've got plenty to talk about here. Um, I mean, let's consider some of the numbers that I was just well here. I'll read off some numbers for 2020, which was a down year. OK, Honda Accord. Nears makes no difference, 200,000 units. Toyota Corolla, 237,000. Civic, 261. Camry, 294,000. Um, I mean, some some quick math here, what? 255, 750, 850. We're talking a million vehicles right there, um, just in those few. So that's a segment that Ford and, and GM, particularly Chevrolet, that's a segment that they want to abandon completely. You want to abandon a million vehicles completely? What in what bizarro world does that make sense? Especially, especially when you look at other markets around the world. Um, I'm going to take a look here at Europe, where you know the top ten selling vehicles from 2020, and and for whatever reason, Europe. I mean, Europe was hit hard, but it wasn't hit quite as bad as the U.S. China was only down like five percent in 2020. So, I mean, th that's the world's biggest automotive market. They're still humming along. Europe, there is uh, no, 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 no. one SUV in the top 10. Um, the best selling vehicle, obviously, the, is the Volkswagen Golf at 410,000. Um, I don't have numbers for the Clio or, so, or for the Polo, I, I, but I, I mean, yeah, when you look at Europe, one SUV, the Tiguan, that's what one, two, three, four. Tiguan was the fifth best selling vehicle in Europe. Um, you've got the Renault Captur, which is you know, a crossover. <laughs> Um, did I say that right, Bruce? Because I'm Cap terrible with, with no, pronunciation. That, that one's good. Yeah. Um, jump over to China. Now, there are a few Here, more. Wait, what's it? Wait, what? I've got okay, this okay, number okay. up. So just. You, you, so got it, I, you got it up. There. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was only half listening. How many Corolla and Camry sales did you say US 2020? It was like 250 each, right? Pretty much. Toyota Corolla, 237,178. Um, and then you, you asked for the Camry? Yeah. 294,348. Okay. So Corolla and Camry sedan. And I, I, I guess you get the, yeah. Corolla sedan and hatch. Yeah. And I guess we don't know Avalon, but whatever. So calendar year 2020 in the U S uh, Jaguar Land Rover moved 425,974 units. And that was down 23.6% from 2019. So based on what we're talking about here, Toyota moved more Camrys and uh, Corollas than the entire brand of Jaguar mm -hmm. Land Rover. And we are not saying, you know, we're not talking about um, profit margins or anything like that. It's just interesting to see that people that say that there's no more market for sedans, there's clearly a market for sedans, especially if you build a good sedan yep. because, you know, Toyota at least can outsell a whole OEM and that's not even considering the RAV4 which we know is a huge seller any of the Lexus models like they're making bank basically right and and the point I'm making the point I want to make sure that people understand I'm not saying kill all SUVs and crossovers no and, no no, and no go back to sit in um but when you when you look at the bigger picture let, let me let me run through um again just the top 20 sales actually I'm going to pull up uh, a feature article here. I, I, I'm not going to share it. I'm just using it for reference here. Mm -hmm. When you look at sales, um, let me let me go back to 2019. I mean, you have you have 
multiple Nissans, you have multiple Toyotas, you have multiple Hondas. Um, 2019, you have the Ford F series at number one at 896,526 units. And I know I'm picking on Ford. I'm going to pick on GM here in a minute. Um, and that's pretty much it for Ford in the top 20 in 2019. They had the escape at number 14. The Explorer was having some teething issues and didn't make the top 20. So top 20 sales in the U S if it wasn't for the F one fifty, Ford would be in serious trouble. Now it doesn't take a, a master's degree in business to understand if you put all your eggs in one basket sooner or later, you're going to drop that basket and you're going to be in trouble. And I tell you what, that happened to all Detroit automakers in, in 2009, 2010 at the big crash when fuel prices spiked up and the people, economy crashed and, and the economy crashed and people could no longer, I mean, you could see it leading up years before, you know, as, as prices were steadily going up, people, okay, they then couldn't afford their vehicle payments. And then they, they started to have trouble just even affording to put gas in the, in the, in the trucks, in the SUVs. And then that started going over to, okay, we're going to, we're going to put it on our credit cards. And then they had the credit card debt and that kind of all, I, I mean, I was, I was in a position in Southeast Michigan where I could kind of see it happen over the course of, of a few years. And it culminated into that big crash. And I mean, I see it happening again right now. And when you look at the portfolio of vehicles in the rest of the world, why on earth would, would an, any automaker think that putting all of their eggs in one basket is a good idea. And I know what Ford is thinking and I know what GM is thinking. We have our subcompact crossovers. Those will be the small, affordable, efficient vehicles that people will buy if prices go up. But Bruce, I need you to talk for just a minute now because I am going to pull up a report that we did a little while ago that says, you know what? Maybe people aren't going to do that. Fair enough. Yeah, I think you make a very good point. And that is that, you know, Ford's decision to go full crossover and truck, GM's decision to kind of soft do that. GM certainly still has sedans, but, you know, they're more higher priced models that it it's a risky move. And as you talk about this, it makes me wonder whether what we now know as Stellantis with, you know, Peugeot, Citron, FCA, that they might have an interesting trick up their sleeve if things go bad, because those uh, Peugeot and Citron specifically are very European focused. And Europe has always kind of been the home of smaller vehicles. It's just because more densely populated, uh, more densely populated in the cities, um, higher taxes on vehicles based on displacement and things like that. It's just, it's always been the home to those vehicles. And so if things really go bad, they have this kind of whole vehicle network to call upon that if for whatever reason, you know, the Ram isn't going to be able to sell, they have these smaller vehicles that they could bring in. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now let me, uh, let me, just show people on YouTube here and I'll, I'll be talking about it as well. This was yeah. a report that I came across November of 2019. Um, and the headline for this article, Chevy Cruze Ford focus owner switching to other brands. Um, and if I remember correctly, okay. Yeah, this was, this was something done through Edmonds. The crux of the story is that Ford and Chevrolet are saying, okay, we're going to pull away from sedans and hatchbacks and we'll move those buyers into our small, um, you know, compact crossovers and our compact SUVs. And this study said that actually, no, um, let's, let's see here. Edmonds determined that 42% of focus and cruise owners are not, not making the jump to SUVs specifically 23% of cruise owners left Chevrolet and bought a car from another automaker. The number is even higher in the focus camp with nearly a third of these former blue oval owners trading in their car for something from another brand. So once again, I mean, not just, not just from a standpoint of, okay, you know, let's, let's have a diversified portfolio here. 
um, in case things go bad, their 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 initial thinking is is even flawed here. I mean, if if this report is accurate, and uh, I mean, I I tend to uh, I tend to put some decent stock into Edmonds here. Um, oh yeah, they people they, yeah not not everybody wants to have a small crossover. Not everybody wants to have an I, and I'm one of them. You know, it's it's just my wife and I. Uh, we don't have any big dogs. We don't have any kids. We don't really have a need for a larger crossover. Ideally, I would like to have my modest sedan, um, a, an inexpensive fun car, and then maybe a small pickup truck that I could use for, you know, if if I need to go to the lumber yard or, or, or something to that effect. Um, a crossover compromises, an SUV compromises on all of those fronts, and you know what? I'm just not interested in making a compromise. And there are a lot of people that feel that way. So once again, I come back to who, who thought that this was a good idea when you look around and see that, okay, people definitely aren't just jumping onto that bandwagon. And again, we we're not saying get rid of SUVs and crossovers altogether. We're not saying that at all. What we are saying Ford and Chevrolet is come on, let, let's let's not just completely abandon this segment that, <laughs> frankly, has existed for decades, mm-hmm. and uh, and is still shocking. I mean, I'm I'm left wondering. Okay, when will Chevrolet and Ford reverse course? I think it's. I mean, I think it's a matter of time, and and I wonder if it was ever really their intention to completely abandon those segments altogether. And I and I find it very interesting that since those announcements. Since those announcements, so many other automakers have stepped in and said, no, we're not going to do this. Are you crazy? Right? I don't. So if we're specifically talking about Ford and General Motors, I don't know if I agree with you, at least as long as the market stays the way it is. And the thing is, is that it never does until there's some big change they are going to stick with what they're doing because they're making loads of money. But it's so short-sighted. That, you know? Yes, exact, that's the issue, that, is that, that you have why... your your Honda, your Toyota, your Nissan, and I'm sorry that they're all Japanese auto, it's just the way it works, is right. that they kind of have this much broader portfolio of vehicles. That if you look at Honda, they do have a pickup. It's not necessarily popular everywhere, but they have the Ridge Line. If you at look at Toyota, they have the Tacoma, the Tundra. That you know, it's not like they are saying no. We're not going to build trucks. We're not going to build SUVs. It's just that they have this much broader portfolio. That it seems that they are in a much better position. That when things shift, that they are going to be able to juggle their market lineup better to be able to deal with that. Whereas, like you were saying, Ford and GM has very much put all of their eggs in the basket that we are going to maximize profits off of these vehicles. And as long as things stay the way that they do, we're going to make money. The issue is that as, you know, people our age have seen the market doesn't stay that way for it doesn't stay that way and i mean i'm continually amazed i know there are people out there way smarter than me trust me i encounter them every single day same and it's like it's like i see this as plain as day we're on the cusp of another housing bubble we have we have the market that was already the, the automotive market that was already starting to slide before covid kicked it in the behind uh i mean how can you not see that there is going to be a big change coming is going to be coming very soon and you know our our detroit automakers and we haven't really talked about stellantis and by stellantis i'm talking about chrysler and dodge here um i touched on them a little bit and and, and, and even jeep i mean there's there's the dodge charger i mean that's not a small economical sedan i mean it's it's a cool sedan it's a large sedan it, it's a large sedan that's not particularly roomy inside. But uh, that thing is so old that they have paid off the tooling so long ago oh yeah. that what they must make bank off of that car. But that, but they but they still need to have some options. Right. When and yes, I'm saying when things get tougher. I, I mean, what am I going to buy from Dodge or Chrysler? Under twenty five thousand. That's neat. That's kind of fun. 
that has some practicality. It's also good on gas. I mean, that's the thing. Right now, there isn't nothing. An answer. Not a damn thing. And and that's pretty tragic. Um, I can go get an eighty thousand dollar Hellcat something. TRX. Rango yeah, you, you know, yeah. you know, name, you know, insert, uh, insert whatever Dodge Chrysler product, Jeep product you want in there. It's it's extraordinarily. It's just so short sighted. I can't understand why there isn't more concern from these brands. At least, I mean, at least with General Motors, we're seeing General Motors really trying to take some strides um, in the electric realm. And, and Ford too. Let's not count Ford. Yeah, like yeah, Ford Mach E. Uh, we know the F one fifty EV is coming. Let's not. You know, but, let's but, be fair but, here. But but again, we're talking about vehicles that are going to be what fifty thousand. Prop. Yeah, probably. I mean, I mean, I'm not made of money. I'm not. I'm not bad, but I'm not made of money. Because I've been looking at vehicles the last year or so. I've been staying pretty much under twenty five thousand. I don't. Mm-hmm. I mean, sure, there there are more expensive vehicles that I would like, um, and that I could afford. But I'm just not interested in having that kind of a monthly payment. I'm not interested in putting that kind of cash out. So, what vehicles are offered in that range? There are a lot of them. None of them come from Ford, General Motors. Or Stellantis, by that I mean Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep. Can and we just I say th- Stellantis I- is a stupid name? Can we just? I, this is not the point of the podcast. <laughs> it is not stupid name. Every time I say Stellantis, it's like I want to go get in my space capsule and fly to <laughs> Pluto. That's. I mean, that is such a cool sci-fi name. I dig it. No, it's not. Who, who have, no, it who doesn't came up mean with Stellantis? Anything. It doesn't like. So it doesn't you hear the word Stellantis. You think. Chrysler, Peugeot, Citroen. Like, it doesn't think tell like, you anything about the companies that it belongs to. I mean, I hear Stellantis and I'm thinking, okay, is there some cool, obscure sci fi <laughs> flick from the 80s that I missed somewhere? Yeah. It's like, it's like The Adventures of Stellantis. That would be a killer movie right there. It would be, but it doesn't tell me anything <laughs> about the cars that they sell. They're in the auto business, and I don't know what the hell they do day to day. They had to come up with something. It was such a big merger. I mean, what, what are you going to do? It Call it a... FCAPSA. It, <laughs> of course, that just rolls it's six right letter. off. Yeah, no, it rolls does. right off the tongue. No, it doesn't. It's six At, letters, two of which are the same. <laughs> It sounds like a sexually transmitted disease, and you know it. It sounds like something you have to go get a shot of penicillin for. You're okay. You're. I, I'm not going to fight you there, <laughs> but still, uh, I feel as though it's better than still. Anyway, okay, we're, we're off topic. We're, we're we off are, topic. Podcast at motorone.com. Tell us what you think of Stellantis and their weird naming scheme. I, I don't like that name. Anyway, tell us what you think about hatchbacks and small cars. And now, Smith, it is time to actually have some fun tonight. Rather than be Debbie Downer, let's talk about the small sedans, mid-sized sedans, hatchbacks that we either you and I would personally like to own or that are forbidden fruit. And we're not, you know, came from some foreign market and we would like to own someday, but it's probably never going to happen because we have to import it. So are you ready for that? Can we do that? Can we have some fun? Oh, I, hey, I've been having fun this whole time. What are you talking oh, about? I, 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 I love I love just railing on automakers when I can so easily see they're making some of the stupidest decisions. That said, oh, why, why don't you go first on this? I mean, because okay. yeah. I'm thinking I'm not necessarily thinking vehicles that I would want right now, but just oh, okay. with 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 the passing of of sedans and hatchbacks from from Detroit automakers. Uh, so it, 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 it makes, mine's me, it not makes from me from Detroit. And it, it makes me, it makes me kind of want some of the, you know, classics back. So I, this is a car I've been thinking about a lot recently, and I'll just go ahead and straight up tell you why. And our audience is probably going to be bored to tears. I got the 4k release of Dawn of the dead. And if anyone has ever seen that movie from 1978, there is a scene in which they drive a Volkswagen Sirocco through a mall and lock doors in order to keep zombies from coming in. Mm -hmm. And I have always had a love affair, not with the first gen, but with the second gen Volkswagen Sirocco, technically it's a hatchback. You're going to tell me it's a coupe. You're not wrong. It is a coupe, but it also has a hatchback. Yep. I, I just love this car. The second gen, it's like the poor man's DeLorean. 
I just like it a lot, man. Like I, I wanna, I wanna dig it, and you want to? No, you have to dig it. Well, it, it's a cool car. I, unfortunately, I have a very negative association with it. Uh, with a person I knew several years ago who was just just head over heels for these cars, but he was just an ass. So <laughs> it's well, I, I'm sorry, I'm, but... sorry VW people. I, I should I should fan. I should like I should like the car, but uh, I, oh, I just didn't like that guy. Okay, well, so, I'm, so I'm sorry to bring up on, bad memories, but shame on me. Yeah, that's I'm going to be drinking tonight, Bruce. Okay, well, your turn. I've got others. Don't worry. Okay, my turn. Well, you know, I'm going to start off with Chevrolet, um, and I know oh, a okay. lot of people. You know, what, let me let me zoom this in here a little bit before I. Uh, yeah, let me see what you got before I share the screen because, and and this goes back to a little bit of the pop culture episode that the podcast that we did, um, what was it like a month and a half or so ago that yeah. more of you people should yeah. have responded to. Come on, freaking pop culture people. It's, it's the reason we get up in the morning and, and generally don't go to sleep at night because we're watching all of the cool stuff that we love. It's true. Um, wait, 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 really- while we're doing this, everybody. For whatever reason, our Bronco episode did not go up in our timeline. Oh, listen yeah, to our Bronco time. episode. It was fantastic. 700 of you have listened to it. It's like our least popular episode because of technical issues. Yeah, Please there was listen there was a to it. We, we, need to, we need to get our marketing people. Oh, wait, we don't have marketing people. Oh, yeah, damn it. Okay. Let me, let me share this screen because over yeah. the years, I've really developed a passion for the Chevy Impala. Um, going all the way back Hatch to the sixties. Oh, oh, we're talking sedans. Oh, Sorry, we're, we're I'm still talking, hatchback we're, mode. Sorry. We're, we're talking sedans here yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, you know, when when the bathtub Caprice came out, that was I think nineteen ninety one. It just looked it looked so goofy. Um, I think I think the years have been kind to it. Agreed. I think the years have been far more kind to the Impala that didn't have sort of the same kind of bathtubby. Uh, appearance when the 94 impala ss came out i mean that thing was just cool as hell yeah and it's and it's still cool to this day um i've had two buick roadmasters one sedan uh b-body sedan a 94 and then i had a 94 wagon which i I mean it it was the same lt1 engine the i mean the impala had other tweaks over those Mm -hmm. i've never had the impala ss these are these have been going up in value for quite a while. Yep. And I mean, with with Chevrolet stepping away, I would love to see a new Impala. And I think a lot of people would love to see a new Impala. You know what? I mean, go ahead and, and make it a, an EV that that has just a ridiculous amount of power, but but still has, you know, a, a sizable presence. I, I mean, you can do it. You can do it. And you wouldn't really be competing with anybody else right now. Mm hmm. And Impala has a long name with Chevrolet or a long history yes. with Chevrolet. And Very that's a long name history. that, you know, it, it there's, there's equity in this brand and it's, it's a shame to just kind of toss it away. Now. I mean the, well, I mean, even to some degree, I'd like the, I like the styling of the, uh, of the most recent Impala generation, mm-hmm. but it, it wasn't particularly, you know, inspiring. Otherwise it, it it's a case of, in my mind, it's a case of General Motors saying, "Okay, well, we're just going to focus primarily on our SUVs and uh, and our pickup trucks, and you know, we're cutting the budget for for cars." And that's what happens. And then you turn around and say, "Well, people, the market isn't interested in sedans." Well, no, the market isn't interested in your Endorse. sedans because you turned your back on them, people. Huh, okay, that, I'm off that rant. Impala, I would, I will own one of these one day. Um, I'll even get, I'll even go old school. I'll get the, uh, I'll, I'll get an older 67 Pala four door. I'll pretend to be the, uh, the Winchester brothers from supernatural. I love that show. Fair. What else you got, Bruce? So this is pure nostalgia and I'll admit that my very, very first car. And I will be sharing a photo of it momentarily was a 1986 Saab 900 eight valve automatic, which for any any of our listeners, that was the dead slowest version of that car ever made. Um, the one we're looking at here is a turbo. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's got that's Sweden for sure, because I'm pretty sure I've been there. Anyway, yeah. Um, 
And I love these cars. I still think they look good. They I do. St- I, I still kind of love them. Um, for our YouTube viewers, here is going to be the one that I owned. Uh, this is when, so the image here, this is when I was putting it up on eBay to sell. Uh, she was a good girl. The automatic transmission died. I was a 17 year old and didn't have any money to fix it. So I should have kept it. If it had been me now, I would have fixed it and kept it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, Saab, I mean, that that's another vehicle that I've danced around a few times and never pulled the trigger on. I, I, I like the, uh, the, just, you know, the, that version with the hard top, I think the convertibles look even better. And I know there are some people that don't like the convertibles, but just, I mean, just the quirkiness, the, it just looks so good with the top down, I think. So here's the interior. Mine was. So either New Mexico or Arizona originally. So you can see that the f- seats are fried, but you know, it's all supposed to be that kind of burgundy color on the inside and it it's not anymore. Um, <laughs> Wait, the seats were supposed to match the carpet. Yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. They're, they're a little, uh, they're a little, uh, well, if you look at the door panel on kind of the top, you can kind of see like the mid section. So the carpet is red. The door panel is, I don't like know what color I'd call that. And then the seats are almost white <laughs> and they're all supposed to be the same, but you kind of, you never fall out of love with the first one, you know? And I still, I, I, I would like to have the pinnacle of this car. I don't necessarily want this car back, but if I could get a turbo or an SPG with the five speed, I would be so, so happy. So, you know, I, I haven't followed those recently. What are the values doing? Because they haven't I've, gone up. They've gone up some, but they haven't gone up the stupid amounts that like, you know, Japanese cars of this period like, have right, that okay. pony, car, you know, your Mustang Camaro of this period have. They're still, you know, I I paid, uh, what, 1200 for mine. And you could still you could get a turbo for 10 grand easy all day. Okay. So not like it, it's a decent amount, but you know, if you look at, you know, a five Oh Mustang from this period, those have just gone up so much. If you look at, you know, a Supra a civic SI, that type of stuff of this period, that stuff has really gone up. So you can still, you know, they're still affordable in my and, opinion. And, and these are a neat way to kind of maybe dip a toe into a classic vehicle. Yeah. Without, without, spending a lot of money having something that's unique that you're not going to see all the time no. th- that's going to be enjoyable to drive yeah you know what that, that that could be a way to go okay your turn my turn okay i'll i'll jump over to a hatchback here and i'll uh, i'll jump back over to ford i'm sure people that listen know that i have an affinity for ford and i've owned a lot of fords but i i like a lot of cars um one of the fords i owned was a 1990 Ford Escort GT. That's oh, those not, are cool. That that's not what you're about to see. This oh. one, I I loved this one, but I also hated it because I it was a four hundred dollar winter beater that I bought. Um, it was an EXP. It, it was it was rust. No, no, it was it was a it was a regular Escort GT. It had the if I remember, it was the one point nine liter. Um, it was rusty, and by that I mean kind of had no floor rusty Mm -hmm. um the rear springs had brackets in them presumably because something was rusted or or jammed up in there so basically it has solid rear suspension it was i bought it for 400 bucks it was a winter beater but i cleaned it up and you know it goes back to what i said earlier it doesn't have to be fast no to to be fun and it just it felt like a little go-kart and because of that, I mean, I always wanted to sample one of these. I mean, Bruce, I'm sure you know what that is for the folks not on YouTube. That is a Ford Escort oh, yeah, Cosworth. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is a Ford Escort Cosworth RS. And I, I mean, we can get those now imported. Yep. Legal. But Although they're pretty pricey. <laughs> they're extremely pricey. And I mean, they're extremely fun. Um, but with with Ford not doing this sort of thing anymore, I mean, once again, I guess the escort name in the United States 
didn't carry quite the same weight as it did across the pond. Um, right. I mean, I mean, I mean, the escort was just such a legend in the rally scene. But with our global community these days, I would love to see Ford resurrect the escort. You know, give us yeah. something a little different. Don't I mean this is that is that a crossover, Bruce? Because I mean it has some right height to it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, it, yes, I, it I mean, I mean, I mean, it had yeah. Okay, this, could this really be a crossover? I mean, it, it's you know rally heritage, so it, it it wasn't slammed right on the ground. A lot of people did slam them, but I would love to see a new escort come about. I would love to yeah. see Ford. I, I mean. Go back to some of your of your pedigree. Go back to some some of your brand equity that you have in some of these names. We've talked about and this before. The Thunderbird name is begging for a comeback on an EV. It it really is. Um, it would be perfect. Thunderbird it, and Lightning. Yep. Come on, Ford. That's just like that's easy. That, that's it's right it's, there. <laughs> it should be a no brainer. Um, you know, instead we have the EcoSport and. And Mach E. Why is it Mach E Thunderbird? Because it's a Mustang. <laughs> okay. It's a Mustang. He yeah, says. In, it, he, he says with air quotes. Yeah. But no, you know, with with sedans and hatchbacks allegedly being gone. But a Thunderbird what, what, has what been we, everything. It has been a two seat roadster. It has been a four seat personal luxury coupe. It you know. It's it's been a four door. Did you know they made a four door? I did know that. Yeah. yeah. Yep. It's it's been a four door. Um, the best selling people love to remember the fifty five to fifty seven Thunderbird. The best selling Thunderbird seventies, right? The late seventies when they yeah. were pretty much as big as they'd ever been. Yep. So yeah, again, lots of lots of great uh, of heritage there that, in theory, we'll never see because Ford isn't going to do that anymore. So. Speak up, people. Tell Ford that they're they're just going crazy here with some of these ideas. You got anything else, Bruce? Oh, of course. Yeah, I can all do right, this all night. Um, let's, so let's two quick going. ones. So, so one super quick one and one that I'll kind of talk a little bit more about. Um, so we were talking about escorts, and it just reminded me of the Export EXP, Escort EXP, um, <laughs> which was the two-seat version coupe. Yeah. Um, a girl I cool. A girl I knew in high school had one of these, and I, I asked her if I could ride it at one time. And unfortunately, her and her boyfriend were in it, and she said she w- her mom wouldn't let anyone ride in the back. So I never got to ride in it because um, I was a you know a car guy even in high school and enjoyed weird, quirky stuff. So yeah, that's my escort GX EXP story. No, I'm I'm. I'm glad you brought that up because I've seen those from time to time and I've, I've often thought about them. I think about so many cars, but the only thing I don't think about is a grand dam. We've, we've been down that road before. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in fact, I even test drove. Oh wait, no, that wasn't an, an EXP. That was a ZX two, which was kind of the, the evolution. Sure. Um, but uh, it just uh, the ZX2 just didn't really do anything for me. No. But okay. I always dug the look of that EXP, especially the earlier ones before they got the flush headlights, which came about I think in the late '80s, um, where, where they had kind of that uh, just just that kind of chunky, mm-hmm. blocky, angled light. Yeah, this is. It looked. It was one they of those. Had to incorporate the looked, sealed beam headlights, and yeah. they didn't do it well. But yeah, I mean it. It was it was one of those cars that looked fast just sitting still. And the irony is, it's that it it's wasn't fast, fast at all. <laughs> it was so not fast at all. No. Okay, so here are two cars. The first one I wish I could have the style of, and the second one I wish I could have the engine of, and I wish I could like smash them together. So these are both forbidden fruit examples. First one we're going to look at here is an Alfa Romeo 145. Hmm. To me, that is just a really nice looking little hatchback. Um, obviously never came to the United States, just kind of a, you know, kind of a neat looking hatchback. Mm-hmm. Second one we're going to look at here is an Alfa Romeo 147, which was the uh, successor. And this is specifically the GTA model. And that got 
the final iteration of the Busso uh, V6. So this is a 3.2 liter V6 driving the front wheels, unfortunately. But uh, if any of you have ever heard one, the Busso V6 is perhaps, it ranks among the best sounding engines in the world. It also happens to be one of the best looking engines in the world. Um, I don't have a good engine shot. This uh, image I'm going to be putting up here, this is the three liter version. Um, the car I just showed you had the 3.2 liter version. So just a little bit bored, but it has these uh, polished um, intakes on it. And it's just gorgeous. It's one of the prettiest engines in the world. And I, it I, is. I can't play the sound for you here because it doesn't work. But uh, search on YouTube Busso V6 and you'll ha find some videos. And it's just it's this perfect mis mi mix of raspy and muscular. And it, it it's wonderful. And to be able to have it in a hot hatch. Yeah, perfect. So. Well, you know, it, it's interesting that you that you bring that up and you talk about that engine because I'm going to wrap up my portion of this conversation with a car that I do miss. I've owned 12 of these Whoa. Over, the, over the years, so I have a lot of experience, and I will own another one again here eventually, especially this first generation. People that know me probably expect this. The first generation Ford Taurus SHO. Oh, I've had quite a few of these. How many first gens have I had? Let's see. One, two, three. I think I've had four, four of the first gen cars. That's impressive still. And that, or no, no, maybe more than that. One of them was a parts car. I don't really need to count that. Sure. But then, yeah. but then the gen two cars, the gen one cars, I just, I, I mean, I was, I was young when, when the Ford Taurus first came out in 86. And for those that weren't around then, it's hard to describe the effect that this car had on society because this was a time when you looked at the Chevrolet Caprice, which was extremely boxy. Mm -hmm. You looked at the Ford Crown Victoria full-size sedan, which was extremely boxy. Ford's mid-size sedan, they're just their LTD was extremely Very boxy. boxy. Um, everything from General Motors, like the Pontiac 6000. I mean, everything was just boxy, boxy, boxy. Um, you you had Audi, the, the 5000 that was kind of coming around at this time. Even the BMWs of this era, you know, like, like, the, like the 5 Series, I, I mean, they were still relatively boxy. And then this thing came out, and it looked like the freaking future. I mean, that's really the only way you can describe it. It looked like the future. Um the buyers responded. It became the best-selling car in America. Um, and then Ford had the high-performance version in, in 1989 that had that Yamaha V6. Um, I don't have a picture of the engine. Bruce, do you want to find a picture of the Yamaha V6 engine while I, while I talk sure a little bit more about this car? Um, because you talked about the, the, uh, that V6, and it's definitely one of the prettiest engines around. The Yamaha V6 with that, with that just awesome... 12 runner intake system. Um, I think it's also one of the best looking engines around that engine was so far ahead of its time. Um, in 1989, when Ford's five liter V eight was making 225 horsepower, the three liter V six made 220. It did it without any sort of turbo or supercharger. Um, and it was efficient enough where it didn't need any sort of EGR system either. And oh, I don't think I knew that. And with the, well, it needed EGR in California, but it mm -hmm. met emissions everywhere else without any sort of, um, of uh, exhaust gas recirculation system, mm -hmm. which I've found just, uh, I mean, I, I still consider that extremely impressive for the time. Uh, with the five-speed manual, of course, you could only get it with a manual right off the bat. Um, if, you were, if you were gentle on the gas, there were many times I got just about 30 miles per gallon on the highway. Really? Um, That's uh, an impressive number. In in 1989, um, yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was extremely impressive. Zero to 60, about six and a half seconds, if you could get it to hook up. It was always a just a pain in the butt to get it to hook up. Um, I had an 89 with just a few bolt-on modifications that ran a 14.7. That was no no superchargers or turbochargers. I mean, that's that sounds slow these days. 
but back then it was uh, it, it was enough to beat Mustangs and Camaros and I think I think that engine that we're looking at right now is is probably one of the most I won't I won't say it's underrated because a lot of people know it and respect it but they don't know just how technically advanced it was for its time. I mean that's an engine that I think could still have a place in in a modern vehicle today. Um and the sound that thing makes especially when the uh, when the secondary runners it's it's each cylinder is fed by two intake runners. There's the long intake runner that was designed for a uh, for better low end power. Um and then at 4000 well technically 3950 rpms the second set of runners, the little short runners, would open up. So I, I used to talk. Oh yeah, I, I love it when the secondaries open up on my show. And these old school muscle car guys would be like, "Oh, you don't have a carburetor, you don't have secondaries." It's like, yes, here's how it works. So, uh, and when those opened up, I mean, you just got a completely different sound. It was, it was like, like you know, the Honda guys would say VTEC. Mm-hmm. It just completely changed sound, <laughs> took off, and yeah, I'll, uh, I'll have. I'll probably have another one of those one of these days. It's been long enough now where I mean, cause I, I had so many and I was so into them and I had, I mean, I did clubs and everything and then I just kind of got burnt out on them after a while, but I mean, enough time has gone by. I'd, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for, I, I specifically won an 89, um, 1989 still had the old original Taurus dash 1990. The interior changed hmm. 1990. You also got um, anti-lock brakes, 89 didn't have any lock brakes. 89, um, that they were a little bit lighter. They were only like about 3,100 pounds. Um, and I mean, they, they were fairly tossable. So, yes, Ford brought back the Taurus. I was actually, uh, or they brought back the show. I was actually part of that whole thing that happened in 2009 at, at the Chicago Auto Show when they uh, unveiled the 2010 show. And, uh, you know, it was neat, but I mean, they they took it in a different direction. It, it's still... To this day, I mean, it, I mean that car is still just an awesome sleeper. The you know when they went with the EcoBoost V6, but it just it it wasn't it it didn't capture people the same way that that original '89 did. It was a much no, bigger bigger car. It was I mean it was just designed to just be a missile. A lot of people don't realize those first gen shows handled actually surprisingly well. They had big rear sway bars, and it was very easy, even though it was front wheel drive. Very easy to just dip into a little lift throttle oversteer. Very controllable. Um, yeah, Ford kind of had a, a, a secret home run there. Um, and with sedans gone, will we see it again? Well, I mean, is there any sort of crossover that could get a cult following like like that car has developed? I don't know. Yeah. So super quick uh, show question for you. I had always heard they were kind of an M5 competitor in their day. Is that a fair comparison? Um, BMW people are going to hate me on this, but it's, it's absolutely a fair, comparison. you know, like for like per- perfor- performance East. wise, performance yeah. wise. I mean, I, I think BMW still had a, a better interior in, in, but, in luxury, better interiors yeah. for sure. But I mean, when you're talking straight performance, um, I believe the 89 show was quicker than the M five. If it, if it wasn't quicker, it was a dead match. Mm-hmm. If I, if I remember, oh, Actually, maybe it maybe it wasn't quicker than the M5, but it was close. Um, I'm, I'm trying to remember if it was the M5 or if it was the Seven Series. But it, it, I mean, it's definitely right there, um, straight line um, mm-hmm. yep. handling. Well, the M5 was rear wheel, but yeah, it, re- rear wheel. I mean, rear wheel drive is always going to handle better on a track. Um, I mean, I mean, you're you're able to use the uh, the power to your advantage a little bit better. Um, but the show wouldn't leave any. The the show would surprise. I know a guy that that had a '92 the the first year for the second generation. Um, he does. He upgraded the suspension. He he upgraded. Um, he just he was running Eibach springs and and I think Tokiko struts, which, I mean, not a huge upgrade, but it but it did help things a little bit. Um, and I mean, he was out tracking the car and uh, he was pissing people off because, because they're looking in the mirror and it's like, I'm driving this BMW, this guy in this Taurus is sticking right behind me. And uh, I, I remember him telling me he was at Gingerman Raceway in South Haven, uh, for a special event. And he was like, I had a lot of people saying that, Hey, they love the car. This is back probably in the, I think the early two thousands. He's like, now nah, they love the car. And there were a lot of people that were just like, they were just angry. <laughs> You know, so yeah, 
Okay. Will we see it again? I don't know. I hope so. You know, maybe but they always <laughs> exist. That's the thing is that the, the, the classics will always exist. And we can certainly uh, we can certainly appreciate that. Yeah, that's something that I kind of harp on amongst the super hardcore auto enthusiasts that they say, oh, the manual is dying. There are no. millions of cars out there with manual transmissions. Oh, you know, every little bit of tech yeah. or whatever. Like if as long as the passion is there, those vehicles will survive. And I think for the vast majority of vehicles, uh, there is passion for them. You know, maybe, you know, your, your inline six Camaro might die that, that might be a thing, but there will still be Camaros out there that for folks to enjoy. So. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I don't, I don't get the, um, the the hubbub and, uh, and just sometimes just the sheer lunacy that, that some people exhibit when they talk about modern cars and oh, it, it's terrible. And okay. If you like a specific vehicle, you're still going to be able to get a, subs- mm-hmm. a specific vehicle. You're still going to enjoy that. It won't be a new vehicle. No, you're not going to go out and buy that new vehicle. Um, but, but then again, the joy of it. Yeah. Right. I, I, I mean, having the classic still being able to have that classic experience and you know what? I hate to say this for some of you people, some of you listeners out there, there are a lot of new vehicles that are freaking amazing Mm -hmm. and you won't even give them the time of day because you're so stuck in 1970 that you refuse to 1990 or, or 1990 2000 like JDM people. Yeah. I was thinking BRZ folks who are like, Oh, it needs a turbo. Oh, it needs a turbo that people have been saying that since that car came out, it doesn't need a turbo. It's fine. Yep. It's fine. It de- they made it that way for a reason. And if you don't like it, just go buy something else. But it's there for the rest of us. Right. And how many people are just completely ignorant of some of these great machines that are out there because they, A, that they refuse to drive anything without a manual, which, mm-hmm. okay, whatever, if that makes you feel better about yourself. B, they it doesn't have the right badge on the front. Like, it, you know, it doesn't have Kia the right badge. are impressive, but a lot of people are just never going to look at a Kia. But honestly, the, that's kind of the modern muscle car in a certain it's your mid sized car with a big engine in it. That's the definition of muscle car. Yeah. And, uh, and then there are the people that, that will have nothing to do with electricity because it's soulless. And it's like, so getting getting your ass like literally shoved into the back of a seat from instant torque mm-hmm. and hitting 60 miles an hour much quicker than your gasoline powered car can do it is soulless. It's like, come on, people, it, just just get with the times. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with change. There's nothing wrong with looking at what's new and exciting and what's coming f- ahead of us. And there's also an absolutely nothing wrong with fondly remembering and honoring what has gone by and enjoying the past. Like there are still model T's out there on the road that you can own and buy. If that's, if that's what you want, you should go for it. Like, right. And anything in between, like the, the beauty about the automotive hobby is that at this point it has existed for over a century and that it almost, I guess I shouldn't say that every idea has been explored because obviously there's always new things to go on, but there is a niche for everyone. Like mm-hmm. I would love to own a Corvair. I know that there are a lot of people that see no desire in owning a Corvair, but I, I can, and they're still out there. There's still thousands of them out there. So, yep. but basically what this comes down to is buy what you want, drive what you like, and that's fine. I'll uh, I'll close this out by um, recalling an old Top Gear episode, and maybe you remember it. And maybe the listeners out there remember it um, with James May and mm-hmm. Jay Leno talking. I think I think they were. Uh, I think I think May was talking about the the Honda Clarity, the fuel cell car. Mm-hmm. I could be wrong on that episode. I mean, it, we're talking a while ago, but they were talking about the future of motoring and electric vehicles. And I think it was Leno that made the point electric vehicles right now can do what regular vehicles did for the horse back at the turn of, you know, the, the 20th century 
when horses were still very much the main mode of transportation, they were utilitarian. When the vehicle, when the car came about, it freed the horses to be something appreciated and enjoyed mm-hmm. um, for the incredible animal that they are. I remember this converse. I don't, I agree. I don't remember what they're talking about, but I remember this exact conversation. We're at a point now where you can have your electric vehicle. And if you think it's soulless, that's your opinion. You can have your vehicle and even your self-driving vehicle that will get you to where you need to go. And then that frees up other aspects of passionate motoring to really just enjoy and embrace. And and for me, I mean, that, that makes all the sense in the world. I agree. Do you agree folks? I podcast at motor one.com. Yeah. I think that's all there is to say tonight. And again, podcast at motor one.com. That is our email address. Send us emails. We can get an email this week. I feel lonely. Just we get someone a lot of, send me an email and say, hello. We get a it, lot of email through tips. Um, well, maybe they, those maybe, are maybe weird seen, emails. <laughs> some of them are weird, but we, we've also some, had a lot of emails. 90% of those emails are weird. <laughs> hey, you can email us tips at motor one.com. You can email us podcast at motor one. We look at the podcast at motor one.com email directly. Yeah. We are still interested in hearing your car stories. We are still planning a future episode that focuses specifically on rambling about cars listeners so we are happy if, to yeah, hear about you your don't stories. Start sending us your cars i'm just going to start talking to my family members who have interesting cars and inviting them on and pretending <laughs> like i don't know them <laughs> oh One really day, this you weird guy you who, don't say <laughs> yeah like you're my uncle oh you have xxy car never met you before oh that's interesting so get on board folks I've yeah, said so this multiple times. If you have an interesting car that you have been working on over this pandemic, send them to us. I want to see what you're working on. I'm not going to judge you. I don't care if you have a Toyota Cressida or a Pontiac GTO or a Ferrari. Like for the record, for the record, I'll probably judge because I'm I'm kind of a jerk that way. I'm sorry. Well, he's a jerk. He just said it. <laughs> he just said. I, it. I can I can be I can be. No, no. Send us your stuff. Yeah. We'll, Podcast we'll be at motor1.com. We'll please. be kind. Um, you know, you can also follow us on social. Um, I'm on Twitter at CH Writing. Yep. Bruce, I am on Twitter social? at Chris Bruce 1985. That's all together. If you want to follow me there, um, we're always at motor1.com. That's where you can find both of our writing every single day. Um, and yeah, we appreciate you. We appreciate you for listening. Um, last week's episode did fairly well, even if you d- decided not to comment on it. And that makes me feel bad, but <laughs> because it was the, it was the Santa Cruz and we had a lot of good things to say about the Santa Cruz. We did. Uh, to be fair, we had a few Santa Cruz comments. They were just very short. So we didn't comment on, th- on them here, but yeah, um, uh, that's our email. That's our YouTube. And as always, good afternoon, good evening, or good night, wherever you happen to be listening to this, we appreciate you listening. Um, You know, we wouldn't be anywhere without you folks listening to us. So we like that. Um, So good evening. And I hope you find everything we we talked about tonight interesting. So bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.